Medical Chef with the Madison School District here in Wisconsin. And today I am uh, cooking with and interviewing Mr. Chef Yusuf Benrola. Thank you. I'm Yusuf Benrola. I'm the chef and co-founder of Trade Roots Diaspora Gardens. And today we're going to take you on a culinary tour through the African diaspora. From Africa to Wisconsin. Indigenous food. Okay, I have to ask you this because a lot of people don't know. What is a diaspora? So the African diaspora for me, particularly, is the forced migration from Africa, the slavery, and all of the culinary traditions that we've picked up until the present day. So I live in Wisconsin now, and so my diaspora includes all the foods that came in through the slave ports in America, and food traditions that we carried on. The food ways that we found here, we needed to survive. And finding the ingredients, adapting ingredients to flavors that were as traditional as we could get, mm -hmm. and as close to home as we could get. They're the food ways that nourished us and kept us kept us alive. So I'm going to be going behind the camera and Yusuf is going to be doing primarily most of the cooking. This is a trip through the diaspora. We'll be making a diaspora dish of corn kanji and we will have lots of garnishes. So we're going to start by rendering some pork fat and here I have some beautiful smoky um, applewood smoked bacon that I've cut into lardons. And we're gonna add this to the Instapot. All right, so we're gonna slice up some collard greens. And you can see we have some beautiful collards here. And these are fresh from the Diaspora Garden. And these are our first frost collards. The beautiful thing about our Diaspora is that in Wisconsin, we get frost. And so for your leafy greens, like spinach, kale, collards, um, broccoli, root vegetables, anything that is frost hardy will convert its starches to sugars, which makes them sweeter and more delicious and more nutritious for you. It makes more of the nutrients readily available for you. So we can grow better collard greens in the north than they can in the south. So the chiffonade is basically a very fine julienne of rolled leaves. And we're looking for basically a three to four millimeter wide cut. This knife in particular, I'll hold it up for the camera. It's beautiful. It's made by Quentin Middleton of Middleton Made Knives. He is the only African American knife maker that I know of in the United States. And this is a custom bunka, which is a Japanese style knife with a little African flair on it. I wish you could smell this. It's amazing. I'm gonna give it a little stir. Up the My grandmother was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the traditions that she brought north, um, the traditions that she brought north were part of my growing up culinarily and the food ways that she brought north. She lived during a time where people had victory gardens during World War II, and that was a big thing in order to support your family and support your community with nutritious food and also meaningful food to your culture. So I'm just stirring up these lard a little bit, and we're going to render that fat out, and we'll use that fat to cook our greens and also to cook our hominy. The you know, if you're on a low-fat diet, there are ways if you want to use turkey necks, smoked turkey necks, 
um, so you can impart some of that smoky and delicious flavor that people come to expect in collard greens. We're gonna do a quick saute on collard greens here today. So collard greens in the winter are a completely different vegetable than they are in the summer. In the winter, they have the opportunity to convert their starches to sugars, and that makes, makes for a sweeter and more delicious, nutritious drink. And so we don't really wanna overcook it. We don't wanna braise it to death. We're just gonna do a quick saute on this, and this will be a nice topping for our cup of people. So these are beautiful Beauregard sweet potatoes that we grew at West Madison. And this is a vegetable that we were told doesn't grow well in Wisconsin. And we find that it actually does. We harvest it over 200 pounds, which we are curing at this moment. These have been slightly cured. They cure it a little faster because they're smaller. And once they're cured, their shelf life will go up substantially. You uh, met up with another chef named Michael Twitty, and he wrote a cookbook called The Cooking Gene. And yes. you actually took a genealogy test and then traveled back to Africa to explore the food weights of that region. And when you talk about the sweet potatoes or yams yeah. in Africa versus Americas, well, and this is a traditional, or this is a classic example of a food from the diaspora. So we call this yams. If we cook it around the holidays, traditionally we'll make dishes like candy yams. And those are basically, you know, tubers that are sweet potatoes, but we they look similar to yams from Africa. And so when we came here during the slave trade, we found that this is a starchy root vegetable that we can make fufu with and that we can make other dishes with that reminded us of home. It became part of our diasporic lexicon of um, vegetables that we used via forced migration. And to give us a little taste of home. Our lardons are rittering down nicely. Getting a nice amount of bacon fat. We're getting some crispy little bits. And we'll be pulling the bacon lardons out shortly. Just gonna let them cook for another minute or two. Now, the, the heating level that you have on these, now is it hot? Is it medium high? I'm on high saute for Instapot. Um, I've done pork belly, buffalo tongue, pressure cooked in here, and you can, you know, knock out a pork shoulder in just a couple hours with a pressure cooker. Um, so it saves time, it saves space. If it's hot in the summer, it saves on uh, heating, heating up, up your house. house. Exactly. So our light rounds are done. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this and remove my lardons. Add a flat spoon. Put some lardons here. And these will be a garnish for our collard greens on our cotton table. I'm gonna strain out our bacon grease here. We're using some Bear Island Flint Corn from Kevin Finney out of Michigan. We're gonna add that to a little bit of the pork rendering. And we're gonna also use a little nixtamalized blue corn from Dan Cornelius from the Mobile Farmers Market and Tribal Agriculture Council. We have this beautiful beer braising liquid that we use for our beans that will be a garnish for our congee bowl. We're gonna add that now. 
So what I did yesterday, I did it old school. I soaked my beans overnight, and I brought them up with beer, onions, bay leaf, garlic. Cooked them down. Here they are here, all beautiful. They were very delicious. We're gonna take a couple green tomatoes that are fresh from the garden, winter green tomatoes. And then we're gonna take a couple whole chili peppers. We have some peatless habanero peppers here. We also have some buena mulata peppers, which are from True Love Seed, which is an African diaspora seed company here in the United States that you can order seeds from. And it just produces such a beautiful array of colors. And we're just gonna add a few whole peppers to our pot. These are garden eggs. So these are a West African eggplant. And this is another diasporic vegetable that you can grow here in Wisconsin. We're at 43 degrees north. So any of the vegetables that you see here, you should be able to grow here. We're also gonna add these little sweet potatoes in there. Just let them cook with the corn. We're gonna use our bean chili setting on this cooking expo. We're going on high for 30 minutes, high pressure cook for 30 minutes. Okay, so we'll talk about some of the ingredients that we have here. We'll start with these. These little watermelons are a food staple of Nigeria, Togo, Benin, Ghana, and it's a nagusi. So the flesh of a nagusi melon is inedible. But this is also something that we found grows in our 43 degree north diaspora. And this is grown primarily for seeds. Okay, so when you slice into a nagusi, you see this very white starchy flesh and these beautiful, beautiful seeds. Um, you can even make tofu with the nagusi seed. And this is a, a dried. This is dried and hulled nagusi seed. So it's been hulled. Yep, so we'll be toasting a little bit of this and then it'll be part of our garnish for our dish. To the agusi, we have some pepita seeds. And they're more commonly found in their indigenous to the Americas. Now, an agusi or a watermelon and a pumpkin are both percurbents. So they're related. This is used a lot in indigenous cuisines and cuisines of the America diaspora. And these are a staple in West Africa. So we have this beautiful bow and arrow, blue corn from the Ute Mountains. And that is grown on 6,000 acres of beautiful mountain country. This is a nixtamalized version of that blue corn. What is nixtamalization? Nixtamalization is when you introduce an alkaline solution, in this case, hardwood ash, to a pot of boiling corn, or boiling dried corn, and it helps break down the hole. It introduces and makes available to your body B vitamins, and it really makes the whole corn more digestible to your system. And this is fully nixtamalized. You can see there's still a little hole on this corn. It's still more nutritious for you than if you just boiled that corn, but this is fully nixtamalized and de hulled Bear Island Flint corn coming to us from Kevin Finney out of Michigan. So this is actually African sea salt, and this is from Benin and Ouida. And there is actually a village on a salt marsh that has produced salt for hundreds of years in traditional methods. This is the finest tasting salt I've ever tasted. I use it for ceremonial cooking. I also use it as a finishing salt. Um, you know, I've even served it 
in a dish by itself so people can just taste that because it is an ingredient that is unique. We're just gonna make a quick sauce and it's gonna be a rustic finishing sauce. And the things that we're looking for, and this will, you know, just add a nice bright boost to our finished dish. So we have cilantro here, we have limes, orange, so our citrus components. We have our peppers here. We have this beautiful honey that's local from Wisconsin. Got our African sea salt. Got some garlic cloves gr grown at Eagle Heights. So what this sauce does is it combines all of your, your flavors. You've got your bitter, your sweet, your spicy. It all combines in the salty and it combines it all together and kind of is a nice finishing touch. It adds a, a little bit more fullness to, to your palate when you're you're eating your bowl again. We're making a warm bowl that's like a big hug full of all the things that we love. And this usually just adds a really lot, nice garden freshness, the adding a herb sauce at the end. So we've got our cilantro here in a nice bunch. And we're just gonna utilize that form that, you know, we procured the cilantro in to do a nice, fine chop. You'll notice as we go through this chop, we're gonna start out really fine. And as we get towards the top leaves, we'll get a little bit larger slice so that we have some of those bigger leaves. Forward push cut. So then you can see that we have our fine dice of the stems and lower leaves and then it moves into, we have a little spectrum of size and shape. Um, we're gonna do some garlic. Just gonna give that a little palm push. This is beautiful garlic. Grown in high, um, Tom Bryan, professor at the University of Wisconsin and his specialty is garlic. And so he grows this in high sulfur soil. So it just gives this garlic an amazing aroma, an amazing flavor. And we're gonna do a little cross cut. We have our garlic there. It's chopped. We're going like with a rustic chop. Heatless habanero. And we have fish peppers which were used by African American catering companies um, from the Great Depression until this day and grown by them specifically for their heat and their delicious flavor. And I'm just gonna do a slice on these. Going up just until we start to hit seeds. incorporating the product all the way throughout. The flavors change slightly when um, foods are cooked versus when they're fresh. And now this guy's a little spicy. We'll just use a little bit of that. But it's, the flavor's incredible. And the color's just gorgeous. It is beautiful. And you know, some of these colors, um, they kind of fade when you cook. So like the purples will kind of turn to greens or grays. Um, yellows stay pretty much yellow and so do the oranges and reds, but and just something to think about. That's another part of this sauce is that you eat with your eyes first. So when you see this bowl, you're gonna see the brightness of all these foods when you first come up to the bowl. So we got some lime zest in there. And then we're just using the, the outer the outer oily skin we don't want any of the white rind in there because that's going to add bitterness to our finished dish so i'm just grating and we're adding the zest to a dish before you actually juice them it gives it so much more flavor because you're getting all those essential oils there's all these nutrients in there too micronutrients and then the aromas just 
incredible. A little sieve here so that we don't get any seeds or any unwanted parts into our finished sauce. Oh, look at that. That's a pretty one. Wrong with our orange. Orange. Smash it. If you're not really good at smashing things, you can use a little juicing device or the end of a tongs is a reamer. Yeah, this is like one of my favorite it culinary ac activities is <laughs> making sauces. I think that's going to be good. And if you wanted to do this vegan, the the sauce, you would just substitute the honey. Everything else is ready to go if you chose to make this vegan. We have some farm fresh canola oil out of Marshall, Wisconsin, cold pressed. And that's just a neutral flavored oil that we're going to add. Give us a little bit of fat and a little pinch of salt. Massage this together. We just need a little more. Smell that. This is the classic go out to the garden, pick some herbs that go together, put some citrus or acid with it, put what you like in it, a little salt, a little We're going to add a little bit of maple vinegar from the Gun Lake tribe in Michigan. Gun Lake Potawatomi. And then we just have a really beautiful rustic salsa. So we're just going to thinly slice some garden eggs and we're going to roast them off with a little bacon fat. These are eggplant. These are, yeah, West, like, a, a, like a West African eggplant or an Ethiopian eggplant. There's um, such a different texture. It's a different texture. And then you're also, you know, it's a different, slightly different flavor. They're a little bitter, so they're great to use with, you know, some offset, sweet. And, and balanced fatty. And balanced fatty. All right, we're going to add just a touch of uh, maple vinegar, just a touch of uh, bacon fat. Toss these around. A little pinch of our beautiful sea salt from West Africa onto a sheet tray. We're gonna toast our goosey right alongside this. This makes this mom happy. One sheet and less dishes. Our pepitas. <laughs> Get it all done in one, okay? This goes in the oven, 350 degrees, 15, 20 minutes. Call it a day. One of our garnishes for this dish is gonna be our sous vide pork belly. And we've been cooking this sous vide for seven hours at 165 degrees. Um, and there's a little maple syrup in there. I rubbed it with a little dry rub. I don't know, like... smell of vision And then we're gonna pour this braising sous vide liquid into our bowl. Okay? So we have our pork belly. And once again, sous vide, seven, eight hours, 165. That's 
beautiful. And it's just got really nice texture. It's umptious, scrumptious, and succulent. We're gonna finish this on cast iron. You can do the same thing with tofu. You know, sous vide it with your spices, get it absorbed in there, and then go ahead and grill it. That's beautiful. We're just gonna start that sear right there. And meanwhile, we have our beautiful ribbon chiffonade collard green. And you can see how I tilted the skillet so it slides the fat a little bit that way. Or the fat tends to aggregate that way. But we're just gonna do a nice quick sear. We have foam. <laughs> We're just gonna wilt these. We're gonna wilt this. We might get a little bit of like little sear, little brown on some of the greens, but we're not going to cook these until they're gray. You know, you want that textural difference. You're gonna want like, you know, that little crispy, crunchy outside. Now, this side I'm doing a little low and then I cranked up the temperature so that the finished side will be a little bit more crispy so that in a mouth bite you're going to get that soft tender and then crunch and you can see when he's turning it it's very gentle with it because it is on the edge of just falling apart yeah that's beautiful my phone will never be the heat off Woo. Get a little sparky. I'm gonna bring the greens over here just so they can rest. Slide that to incorporate a little bit of that green goodness. And to keep my cast iron skillet seasoned. Just had some good frost. We had our first snow. We're all thinking we want a warm hug in a bowl. So really, this is what has inspired us. The hominy uh, corn pudding kanji is really the, the, the blank canvas for all these flavors. It, our Instapot is now opened. Yes. How is it And look? so we have our beautiful sweet potatoes, chili peppers, and our green tomatoes. All oh. beautifully. That's beautiful. Put together. And the flavors have melded. Oh, look at that little sweet potato. We are now taking our pressure cooked hominy and running it through a little food grinder to make a rice like grain for our corn kanji. In there, there's sweet potato in there. It's all going in. Look at that beautiful. We're just adding some of the braising liquid from the beans and a little bit of the stock and braising liquid from the sous vide pork belly. we have here is our riced hominy in braising liquid to make our congee. And now we're going to add our finishing touches. And sweet potato.
I would love to thank you for joining myself and Irene for this wonderful excursion into Afro culinaria and flavors of the diaspora from Africa to Wisconsin. Enjoy a hug in a bowl. Hey, Yusuf, how's it going? Hey, wait, I think you're muted still. How's that? That's great. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Hi, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much. That video was great. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Um, so we have 15 minutes or so just for some questions. Um, but do you want to start off by telling us some more about trade routes and just the work you do that you've been doing recently? Absolutely. Term? Absolutely. So trade routes was a, is a company that was formed by, um, myself, Devin Hamilton and candy flowers. And we formed it as a way to raise money, to travel to Africa, to explore our genealogy. Um, and so we just did pop-ups at uh, Badger Rock Community Center and around town. We did some weddings and stuff like that. Um, and then eventually we raised enough money that, uh, that so that Devin and I were able, able to travel to Africa. Um, and then now Trade Roots is kind of transformed into a Afro diaspora garden project and farming project where we're growing the vegetables that we can grow at 43 degrees north latitude here in Wisconsin from the African diaspora and uh, sharing the seeds, saving the seeds, sharing the seeds with community members and um, really just, it's kind of turned into a little movement, if you will. So over uh, the course of COVID, we were able to feed roughly 70 families a week. Um, from food that we grew at COVID mutual aid gardens and from the Afro diaspora gardens. That's awesome. Um, so the gardens that you're, the land that you have access to through the university and the land that you're growing on, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the crops you're growing there and the varieties that you're growing? I know when we had talked before, there was a ton of super interesting stuff you were up to. Yeah. So. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions about what can and can't be grown um, in our climate. And, you know, in our research, we found that a lot of it is just that misconceptions. So um, there's people that didn't think okra would grow well here and it grows very well here. Uh, sweet potatoes, there are some sweet potato farmers in Wisconsin, but it's not very widespread, but we were able to get you know, a re, a, like 200 pounds of sweet potatoes that we grew this year. Um, and so in partnership with the University of Wisconsin, uh, we have four plots and then that's kind of expanded. And our goal for next year is uh, to even push that even further. So, um, but yeah, we're growing collard greens, Benny, which is a sesame seed, um, Callaloo, which is a relative of the amaranth. And also it is amaranth, but it's a Jamaican variety that we're growing. Cool. Um, Celosia, which is a relative of the am amaranth plant. And it's the most widely eaten green in West Africa, Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Ghana. Um, and it's a very beautiful, beautiful plant. But uh, we grew three types of varieties of okra. We grew a candle fire okra, a white velvet okra, and a hill country red okra. And those all grew very well. Um, we were able to put those in many of our donation boxes for um, community members uh, throughout the season. So that was really, really exciting to see that pan out. Um, collard grains, watermelon, a goosey, which is a seed watermelon. Um, there's a bunch of stuff I'm forgetting, but we also grew corn and squash and sorghum, um, 
peppers, and different tomato varieties. Cool. Um, so we have a question about the corn here. Someone in the Q&A is wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the nixtamalization process and why it's important. Absolutely. So nixtamalization is a millennia old process of using uh, uh, alkaline agent. In this case, we use hardwood ash to remove, help remove the hull and then um, make the corn more nutritious for your body to digest. Because corn just um, as corn kernels, you have to process it to some degree to get the full nutrition out of corn. So in Africa, they do a lot of fermentation. Um, here in the Americas, they do nixtamalization. So the difference is, is that, for instance, you can't, unless you use, unless you nixtamalize or make hominy from your corn, you can't make tortillas. Um, because, you know, that, that hard indigestible hull prevents the flour from, you know, really forming your tasty tortilla that we all know and love. So we use nixtamalization. <clears throat> um, there's Bear Island Flint corn that we used. We use um, Oneida white corn uh, in that demo. And it, it immediately when you add hardwood ash to your corn when it's boiling, it smells like tortillas. It's just like, mm -hmm. oh, that's amazing. So, and it's delicious. So yeah, nixtamalization. Nixtamalization is very important. And it didn't travel with corn around the world. When corn left, um, when the Portuguese brought corn to Africa and to other places. So there was a lot of pellagra and nutrient deficiency that followed that. Mm -hmm. um, in Africa, over time, they adapted and do fermentation of corn. So their corn dose fermented. And that's another way to unlock the nutrients and to make it more accessible for your body. Awesome. Um, and okay, so then we have in here um, a couple people wondering about you using an instant pot. Um, I know we had talked about you cooking over fire and that's, you know, that's such a different thing just all of the different ways that you could have made the meal that you made, I feel like are really interesting. Obviously an Instant Pot is like pretty, if you have an Instant Pot, you can do that. Can you talk about, um, I don't know, I guess ways of cooking that you enjoy most. I'm assuming an Instant Pot is not like the most thrilling of, of ways for you to feel connected. Well, to you know, Instant Pot's are really cool and you can do a lot of cool, amazing things with an Instant Pot. Um, for the amount of space and portability, that's a nice thing. It's a controllable, um, you know, controlled environment. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, different features that make it very useful. A lot of kitchens use pressure cookers and Instapots. Like even, you know, you wouldn't expect it, but I'm sure like some of the Michelin star places out there definitely have a bunch of those things. Um, so what I use it for primarily is when I do pop-ups so that, you know, there's often times where I might be working with a tribe that has maybe electricity, but doesn't have a lot of like cooking facilities or will be cooking outdoors and we can get, um, you know, an extension cord out there. And it's a way to like cook beans in a rapid, um, it rapidly. It's, uh, you know, and it's just like uh, for, you know, being like a little cooking pot that you can have in, you know, a camera shot. It's also it's also accessible. Yeah. Um, and it's important, I think, you know, like it doesn't require a lot of space in your kitchen. If it's hot, you know, and you don't want to turn on the AC that much um, and you don't want to turn on your oven, you know, it's another option. So um, I love, I love Instapot. I just want to say that. And I love technology. So I love cooking with, you know, um, we did the pork belly sous vide mm -hmm. and we used uh, an immersion circulator for that. And so I, I'll use technology, you know, where I think it's going to deliver the best results that I'm looking for. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but, yeah. you know, and cooking outdoors, if you're, you know, if you're at a park or you're at, um, you know, someplace with like a, like a shelter house, but then they have electrical outlets 
Instapot's invaluable, you know. I take it camping, you know, if there's electricity. Um, and I can go rustic. I can go super rustic, but yeah. Don't downplay the Instapot. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're right about the Instapot. Um, we probably have time for a couple more. Somebody in the chat is wondering if you could talk about the flavor profile of the eggplants. Is it similar to the ones we know here? They look like tomatoes. They are, uh, so garden eggs are, I would say they're a little bit more bitter, but you know, it kind of depends on how old they are. And that was our, yeah, I forgot about garden eggs when I was talking about uh, plants of the diaspora. But that was our first foray into garden eggs and they didn't really produce fruits till like just even like you know a month ago or so um and then the fruits they <clears throat> produce were small so we're going to look at because our soil temperatures here aren't on average you know what they might be in nigeria or togo or Benin. so um we're going to look at uh different ways starting the plants earlier maybe in a hoop house or something like that and then um you know doing uh covering the rows with plastic so that it, it keeps the heat in more um and we're going to see if that makes a difference but yeah they're a little bit more bitter but they're used in a lot of uh different dishes when i was in benin um we had this garden egg salad and I thought it was like, you know, little eggs at first, but it turns out it was uh, stewed, stewed eggplants. Um, and they're good. So it's just like, uh, you know, you can use it in ratatouille. You can use it in just, you know, any dish that you would incorporate eggplant into. Um, I haven't made baba ganoush with it yet, but I'm going to. Nice. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I guess just to wrap up. Is there anything exciting that you're working on or that's coming up soon for you that you want to boost or anything like that? So yeah, our website for Trade Roots 43, it'll be traderoots43.com, will be going live soon. We have a uh, web designer awesome. and graphic artist working on some um, aspects of that. And so, you know, we're expecting that within the next couple of weeks. Um, our social media presence will also increase um, sorry, we've been kind of lacking there lately just because we're saving some of the stuff for the website and uh, some of the projects that we worked on over summer we want to talk about more during the winter. Um, and we're expanding, uh, we're expanding trade routes. So we've got, um, we'll be doing some display and educational gardens at Badger Rock officially. Um, we'll be expanding to some extra raised beds and working on some um, acreage, not um, in partnership with the university, but just so that we have a little bit more sovereignty and freedom to grow um, different crops and then um, you know, work on marketing strategies for that. So yeah, that's what uh, we got in the works. We got a grant from uh, Slow Food USA to expand our project and that, uh, is gonna come in really crucial. We're gonna be implementing some scholarships, um, some seed saving workshops where people will come and we'll build little shelves and uh, get people set up with jars and stuff so they can start their own seed collections. Um, yeah, so that's uh, some really, really good stuff that I'm looking forward to this year. That's amazing, thank you so much. Um, so you said Trade Roots 43, we will be able to drop a link to some of your stuff in the chat so everybody has access to it. Um, and like I said, yeah. the website's not live now, okay. but it's under construction. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah so we'll, we'll make it available on our website when it's ready, but that's super exciting. Um, congratulations on the Slow Foods grant. That's thank so you very much. Yeah. Um, so that's all the time we have, but thank you so much for being here. The video is amazing. It's so good to see you in, in real screen life. Uh, <laughs> it's still screen life, but it's still good. Uh, yeah. so yeah, I think, I think that's it, but we will, um, we have a bunch of thank yous and people saying this was great coming into the chat. So awesome. I just want to give a shout out to Irene Pollage. She, uh, yeah, she's one of my partners and yeah, she's doing amazing work too. Um, so yeah, partnering with her on this project was really, really meaningful. 
Um, and thanks to you for having us. Um, shout out to Dan Cornelius, Intertribal Agriculture Council, Michael Twitty, Trade Roots, um, Roots to Glory. We have Roots to Glory here. This is the company that I traveled to Africa with, with Michael Twitty. Um, so yeah, amazing work that's being done by people out there. And yeah, thanks a lot for having us. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn my video off and I will talk to you on the flip side. Thanks, Yusuf. All right, stay solid. See ya. Bye everyone.